such an honor to share my heart tonight. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much to Regine and to Salma for allowing me to share my heart. And special shout out to Brianna for taking two hours to go over my lesson with me today. I'm so grateful for you. But as I was uh, reflecting on the lesson that I wanted to share with you all tonight, there's a quote that I came across. It's by Winston Churchill. It says, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. I love this, this quote so much because when I think about this quote, I think about my own life as a Christian. I was baptized about 10 years ago, and it's been a journey. It's been absolutely amazing. Before I became a Christian, I grew up in a household with my mom, and my biological father left when I was about four. So when I got to study the Bible, I got to see what a family felt like. I got to see what safety felt like. I got to see true family, have true friendship, and be able to totally be healed from all of the things that I had gone through. It was so incredible to see the many successes that God was going to do in my life. But throughout the 10 years that I've been a Christian, there have been many failures as well. When I was reflecting on this, it, it led me to a scripture. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, I'll read it in the NLT. Again, that's 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. It says, so be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong, though many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. I love this scripture so much because Peter is helping us to see that through trials and suffering and fire, our faith is proven genuine. The title of my lesson tonight is Proven Genuine. Sisters, my, my prayer by the end of my, my short lesson tonight is that you see that you're not just having trials, but that you're grateful for them. Let's examine why Peter's conviction in 1 Peter 1 was to go through many trials. My first point is you must endure many trials. Let's go to Luke 22, verse 31 through 32. Again, in Luke 22, verse 31 through 32, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Wow, this scripture is so powerful. Just to set up the moment for you, Jesus and his disciples are in their last supper. This moment is so profound. Jesus had walked with his disciples for three years. And in this moment, he turns to Peter and he says, Satan, Satan himself has asked to sift you like wheat. I looked up what the definition of sifting is. And the definition of sifting is to shake someone apart. It's to break a person down. So Satan was asking to break Peter down. So then I began to have a quiet time on how Satan was going to break Peter down. And it was through fear. It led me to John 18, 8 through 11. And this is the moment where Jesus is taken into captivity. He finishes praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And here he fully, willingly surrenders to the guards. But in this moment, it's the first moment that Peter ever sees Jesus surrender to someone. The whole time, Jesus had walked through a crowd that wanted to throw him off the cliff. Jesus had done so much. He went up to the Pharisees and talked to their face. He told everybody who he was to a certain extent. But in this moment, Peter saw his Messiah, his leader, was going to go and die. And so what does he do? He grabs a sword 
and he cuts off a guard's ear. Jesus had never taught him violence, but he turns to fear. And as we know, in Matthew 26, in verse 58, Peter begins to follow at a distance. You know, sometimes we can follow at a distance. We see our Messiah, the the incredible God, but we see the trials that come along with it. And we follow at a distance. And then in John 18, verse 17 through 18, we get to see the climax of the story. What Jesus had predicted was that Peter would deny him three times. And Peter, he, he's insistent. He's like, I will never do that. I'll never leave you. He wasn't like, he wasn't humble in saying, how do I stay faithful to you? He didn't stay up all night and pray like Jesus had done. He wasn't totally surrendered. And so in this moment, the scriptures say that he was warming himself in front of the fire. And then a servant girl comes up to him and asks if he's with Jesus. This this tells me three things. One, that it was cold that night. Two, that Jesus was cold that night. And three, that Peter had gone back to his comfort. I, I, I think about this scripture and I think about how Satan has sifted me in my walk with God. About two years ago in 2022, God allowed me to be able to move to California. I was leading a ministry in Hawaii, and it was super awesome to be able to be there. I had just started dating the man of my dreams, and it was super awesome. And then all of a sudden, I woke up for church service, and I had excruciating pain in my back. And I had to be rushed to the emergency room. And throughout all of this, I was super faithful. The disciples were calling me. I'm so grateful. Ashley Ajay brought me all kinds of treats after my surgery. It was an incredible time. Like, all the disciples were calling. I remember Sharon brought me this lotion that, like, changed my life. Like, it was absolutely, it was awesome because the disciples were there to support me. And I felt super fired up. I felt super faithful that even though I had to go through this surgery, that God was going to bring me through it. And I was so grateful that the surgery that I had to go through was successful. I had a a big kidney stone that I couldn't pass on my own. And it was pretty excruciating. But one of the the procedures that they had to do was put a stint in me. So they put a stint into my kidney that went into my bladder. And my body rejected it. So what would have taken a few days to recover took me a month of being on bed rest. And eventually, the disciples, they, they are super encouraging. They would call, and they would do all of these amazing things for me. But my heart started to harden little by little. I started to find myself finding my comfort in people, wanting people to please me, wanting people to do what I wanted them to do. It, it became easier to have impure thoughts. It became easier to do things as a task rather than because I loved God. I began to follow Jesus at a distance. I became critical of the leadership in my life. I became critical of everyone around me. I became idolatrous of my friends and my my family. And to be honest with you, I know I'm not the only one. I know that we have all struggled with these things at different points in our discipleship. Satan has asked to sift us like wheat. And at the end of the day, sisters, when we go through these trials, we have two choices. The first choice is to be sifted and destroyed by Satan. Or the second choice is to be refined by God. When we're destroyed by Satan, what it looks like is that we give in to impurity. The idolatry of school or work, looking to people to meet our needs isolating, pulling back, missing meetings of the body. We feel like giving into these things, giving up, will make the trial feel better. It will take the trial away from us. But just like with Peter, the trial didn't end at the cross when Jesus was abandoned by Peter. The only thing that changed was that now Peter had to go through it without God. We have to change our perspective, ladies. When we go through trials, we can see it as something that's crushing to us, something that's going to take us out. But God sees it as something that's going to produce beautiful faith. My second point for us is these trials will prove your faith more precious than mere gold. 
if we look back in the scripture, in Luke 22, verse 31 through 32, what's interesting is it says that Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. So, so this scripture tells me something, that Satan had to ask God to be able to sift him. So this is, this is a reference to Job 1 through 2, that Satan wanted to, to shake Peter violently so that he wouldn't live, so that he wouldn't be able to spread the gospel like he was always told that he was going to do. But why would God ever allow that to happen? Well, during biblical times, the sifting of wheat wasn't just the shaking of a person, but the, the sifting of wheat was to put wheat into a sieve and then violently shake it so that the bad kernel would drop out and the true kernel would remain. In Amos 9.9, 9, it says, For I will give the command and will shake Israel among with all the other nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, yet not one true kernel will be lost. This scripture reminds me of Job 23, verse 10. Let's turn there. Job 23, verse 10. It says, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Wow, I love this scripture so much. I love gold. It's so funny because my husband, he was like, he got me a, a silver necklace. And I was like, wow, I love it so much. And he was like, he was like, I see all of the gold that you wear. You have so much gold. And it's true. I love pure gold. It's so pretty. It's so sparkly. And so when I was going over my lesson to, to really find out how do you get that beautiful sparkly gold, I came across a website that talks about how they actually refine gold. It's a company that will buy your gold and then refine it and then sell it back on the market. And it tells us on their website the different things that they do. And I want to lay out the different processes that gold has to go through to be refined. The first thing it has to go through is that the scrap is selected. So the piece of gold is selected. But it's selected in a very rigorous process. The refiners only work with the high value components from other disassembled devices. The second step is that it's broken down. This is when it's crushed into a powder. That's really cool. This, the third step is an acid bath where it's dipped into nitric acid. The fourth step is the filtering where any other big material that's still in it is taken out. The fifth step is the melting. Now this part is the really awesome part because it says that when, when the gold is being melted, it's put into a crucible. And the crucible is turned all the way up until it turns into liquid. And then at the end, it's refined and you have pure gold. So what does this mean for us spiritually? Number one, scrap is selected. You, my sisters, are very valuable to God. So he chooses the most valuable pieces to be able to refine. Then in the melting process, you're placed in a crucible. Now, the definition of a crucible is a hot furnace that it's put into a situation where you have severe trials. And when it's in the, the crucible, what happens is that it's creating a new creation. And then the liquid, it, it's able to withstand more pressure. So when God puts us into our crucible, when he refines us, He's allowing us to go through that so we can be made into something new, a liquid that's in the form of Jesus. It's awesome because as God purifies us, he makes us into pure gold. Now, what's interesting, a fun fact, is that in Revelation 21, 21, it talks about how the streets are with pure gold. It specifically uses the words that it's pure gold as transparent glass. Wow, so what does this tell me? This tells me I believe what this means is that the streets of heaven are paved with faithful disciples that allowed themselves to be purified by God, so much so that they were transparent. Wow, that's absolutely incredible. It reminds me of Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, though the righteous fall seven times, they get back up. 
this reminds me of the story I was telling you earlier. It didn't end quite well, so I wanted to bring it back around and tell you the good part where I was refined by God. It was an incredible process of refining. And at the end of my recovery, around day 30, I got a phone call. I got a phone call from my mom that my grandmother had 72 hours to live. And on the way to the airport, I started having panic attacks in the car. And then it hit me. I was like, what am I doing? My grandmother needs salvation. I need to get it together. So I got open with the sisters in my life. I shared the things that I was struggling with. I prayed to God and had an awesome quiet time on the plane. And I decided that when I got there, I was going to study the Bible with my grandma. Now, this is a big deal because my grandmother was in a coma. And so me going out there, it was totally on faith that if I would go there, my grandmother would somehow have the consciousness to be able to say Jesus is Lord. And that, that was a big, big jump. But when I got there, my grandmother was coherent. And it was incredible because in three days, I was able to baptize my grandmother. My grandmother is now that transparent gold in heaven. But I'm not the only one with a victorious story. I know many of you are. One of the, the women that, I, that made me cry hearing her story, just out of inspiration, was Priscilla Flores. If you don't know her, she's really awesome. Where are you at? Where's Priscilla? There you are. She's so beautiful. It's so funny. I was on the phone with her earlier in Target, and as I was talking to her, it was breaking up, and she, I was, like, crying as she was talking. And we were talking to each other, and I was like, wow, this is so awesome. I'm so inspired. And then I'm breaking up, and we didn't get to finish the conversation. So here's the end of the story. I was so excited when I got to go on a prayer walk with her. We, we had our, our marrieds event last week, and for two hours, we got to just share our lives with each other. And right after she became a disciple in 2019, she got into a terrible car accident. She was rear-ended at 50 miles an hour, and it made her have brain damage. Every day, she had to go and get rehabilitation for six hours. Shortly after, her husband fell away. Then the pandemic happens, and she has to go into recovery while looking at a screen that she can't even focus on because everything was in lockdown. And I just remember her talking about how what got her through was that she was faithful, that God would see her through this, even if it never got better, even if nothing ever changed, but she was faithful, that being faithful to God would impact her husband. She was faithful that being faithful to God would get her to heaven. And I just was so encouraged. Sis, you leave people without excuse. She showed up to every meeting of the body. She had discipling times, and her husband was restored in 2022. It's so incredible. Another sister that I think of is Lynn Jackson. Yes, Lynn, you. So as we all know, Lynn had a hip replacement a few months ago. And I just, I think about the, the physical trial that you go through with the hip replacement, but that she's always the first to put her hand up for good news about the women that she shared with. And it's so incredible because not only that, at the Memorial Day picnic, she was playing volleyball. And this brother, like, pushed her over, and she bounced back up, and she was like, it's okay, bro. And she just kept playing. Like, it was just so incredible. It was so inspiring. I was like, wow, sis, you leave people without excuse. Another woman that I think about is Tramala. Tramala, man, I love Tramala. Uh, when I was baptized, Tramala was on the mission team to Denver, and that's where I was baptized. And uh, I would talk to her all the time because I wanted to be in the FBI, and that's what she did. And she was, if you've ever seen uh, Criminal Minds, Penelope was Tramala. It's so cool. It's so inspiring. But Tramala moved to San Francisco a few years later. She's had many incredible jobs. And then the call came to move to L.A. on Operation Jerusalem. And she knew, along with her husband, that moving to L.A. would be a financial hit. But she chose to do it anyway. 
she chose to come, and when she came, she came to the West. It was super awesome. I loved it. I was super fired up to be back with Dramala and Afa, and it was so inspiring to be together. But uh, during that time, she had to homeschool her three children while working a full-time job, trying to unpack her house and, and transition into new friendships, new leadership, new, new everything. And yet she did it joyfully. But not only that. A few months later, the call came again for her to move to the Southland. Wow, it's so awesome because Tramala's faith was wherever God sends me, that's where I will go. And it's so inspiring because she was just so faithful during that. Even though there was so much crucible happening around her, she decided that she was going to be faithful to God. And it's incredible because her faith has allowed her to be fruitful, restore women, to be able to be made pure gold. I think about Calcedon. Calcedon, oh, I love Calcedon so much. When Calcedon got baptized, she used to be Ethiopian Orthodox. And when she made the decision to become a disciple, her parents disowned her. And during that time, they cut her off completely, cut off her phone. She had to move out of the dorms and didn't have a place to go. And it was very, very scary for her. But I remember sitting down with her. I was like, Calcidon, move in with the sisters. You'll have an incredible time. They'll take care of you. We'll make sure you have everything you need. And she was like, I'm going to be faithful to God. Her parents didn't even call her on her birthday. But what's incredible is she stayed faithful to God. And this year on her birthday, her dad called her and offered her money and had her over. So awesome. So sisters, there's many trials that we can go through. If you just look around this room, we've all gone through many trials. Maybe you're going through a trial right now. The trial of persecution from your family and loved ones. The trial of your marriage. Or maybe your significant other has stepped away from their relationship with God. The battle of being spiritually barren and fighting for fruit just because you love the lost. The battle of sickness with yourself or the people in your life or maybe a death, financial problems, and even the summer transitions. For some of you, the summer transitions might become, might be a huge trial because this is your first transition. And you don't know if your new disciple is going to understand you in the same way. You don't know if you're going to be able to trust them in the same way. Or maybe this is your hundredth transition, and you, you're like, I don't know if I want to give my heart again. I'm kind of tired of all of this. No matter the trial, God is testing you, and he's refining you like gold. He's asking you, will God be enough for you? Despite what your family says, will you live this new life? Will God be enough for you even when you're having a hard time in your marriage? Even when there's no sheep in the sheep pen, will you fight for fruit just simply because you love the lost and you love God? Will God be enough to sacrifice in your missions? Because you know, you know that when you give to God, it's not about the amount but about the heart. Will you trust God enough to trust people during this transition, even if they hurt you? Sisters, we're going to have pain no matter what. But will your pain have a purpose? Will you be going through this just to go through this? Or will you be refined like gold? So my challenge for you, sisters, from these first two points is to write down how God is challenging you. What trials are you going through? And how will you overcome? Write down the scriptures of how you're going to hold on to God during this time. And then I want you to share it with your discipler but then also another sister in your ministry for accountability. That leads me to my last point, strengthen your sisters. Let's go back to Luke 22, verse 31 through 32. In this scripture, it says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers for us it's sisters but one thing that's really awesome about this scripture is that in my bible it just says you some of your bibles it says satan has asked to sift you all if you, if your bible says you you can look at the footnote it says all of you 
And so Satan wants to sift all of us like wheat. You know, I think about this scripture and how Peter was so afraid to stand up for Jesus in front of all of these people, in front of a servant girl. But we're going to look at Peter's restoration and how he actually came back to God. Let's turn in our Bibles to John 12, John 21 and verse 15 through 17. Just to explain the scripture as we are about to pick it up, in the scripture, Jesus had died on the cross. Peter had witnessed it. He had betrayed him. And he goes back to the Sea of Galilee where he starts to fish again. And when he's on the, the, the sea, he's not able to catch any fish. So what does he do? He looks out, and on the shore, he sees a man who tells him to cast his net onto the other side, which is a reference to Luke 5, verse 4 through 6, when Jesus calls Peter for the first time. He realizes that it's Jesus. He gets out of the boat. He swims to the shore, and he's like, oh, my gosh, it's my God. I can't wait to be with you. And when he gets there, he sees Jesus with breakfast for him. This is awesome because he sees that there's fish and bread. What is this a symbol of? Matthew 15, when Jesus fed the 5,000. And the, the call that, that Jesus is about to give to Peter was about feeding the 5,000. Let's read Peter's reinstatement in verse 15. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I love this so much because the word for take care of my sheep, take care of, in the Greek is papiano, which means to rule and to supply the needs for one's soul. And so what Jesus was saying was go out there and supply the needs for the people's souls. And so what Peter then begins to do is he goes out and he ushers in the kingdom for the first time in Acts 2. This is incredible because what a dichotomy. That just a, a few days ago, he denied Jesus to a little servant girl. But now he preaches the word to thousands. And 3,000 were saved because of it. He takes care of the sheep. And so, sisters, no matter what trial you're going through, no matter what you're going through, preach through your problem. Find a sister, share with her what you're learning, and preach to her. But not only that, find someone who's, who you want to study the Bible with. If you're a mom, maybe it's while you're dropping your kid off and it's, and it's another mom. Maybe it's on campus and you have lots of people to share with. Maybe you have a full day and you just can share with your coworker. Share what God has done and is doing in your life. Sisters, feed Jesus' sheep. It's so incredible because for us, we are the product of Peter's repentance. Peter changed so that we could enter into the kingdom. So sisters, I just, I want you to, to look at your life and be thankful for the trials, no matter how hard they are. Because God is saying there's still some impurities in there that I'm rising to the top. And at the end of your life, when you make it to heaven, you'll be pure as transparent gold. In closing, sisters, I just pray that you can rejoice in every situation, that God is enough for you, and that when you go through these trials, you yourself will be strengthened and you'll strengthen your sisters. Thank you so much for letting me share.